Dr. Raymond Bertino. Dr. Bertino is a member of the Board of Illinois Society of Addiction Medicine, and he's from Peoria. Okay, I'm a retired physician. I'm 65 years old. I retired two years ago. My practice was not in addiction medicine. When I retired, I, I've had several family members that I've known about for years. You know, when I was growing up, I knew about family members who had problems with substance abuse of various sorts. And so when I retired, I decided, well, I'm gonna work on substance abuse issues. And initially, I was focused, I was focused 100% on the opioid issue, mainly because, you know, a lot of people are dying from that. But I turned my focus when I realized last year that the Illinois legislature was looking seriously at legalization of marijuana. And I started to look into it. My initial thought was, I don't think that's such a good idea. We have an opioid problem. Why are we looking at changing other drugs? But I decided to look into it, and I kept an open mind. But it didn't take me long starting to go through medical literature to find out that it just was not a good idea for purposes of the public health. This is a partial list of the medical societies who are against legalization of marijuana. I'm going to tell you straight out, there is one medical society who came out for legalization of medical marijuana. That was California. I have no idea why they did it. No idea. The societies that are against, the state societies, include Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, North Dakota, Ohio, and Vermont, and that's a partial list. It's not a complete list. I went through 19 states. I didn't go through 50. The national societies that are against it are American Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Society of Addiction Medicine, Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago is against legalization. Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Illinois Society of Addiction Medicine are all against legalization. And it's for reasons of public health that they're against legalization. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I already told you a little bit. I'm retired. But there's one more set of facts I want to tell you. I was a smoker from age 18 to 23. I've been a moderate drinker throughout most of my adult life. I'm now a light drinker, but throughout most of my adult life, I was a moderate drinker. And I smoked marijuana about 6 to 12 times when I was in my early 20s. Okay? So I... I clearly experimented, so this isn't about that. What I'm going to say isn't about that. Marijuana use by age. Well, why is that of interest? Well, part of it has to do with brain development. The part of brain development that is the most concerning right now has to do with the frontal lobes. We know from MR studies, I was a radiologist. You know, I did, I, I read MR studies. But we know from MR studies that the frontal lobes, the part of the brain over your eyeballs, does not mature until about age 25. The frontal lobes are what controls executive function and judgment. Executive function, what's executive function? You woke up this morning, you didn't want to get out of bed. You hit that alarm and said, boy, this bed is nice and warm, and boy, I could go back to sleep, and you didn't do that. You got up, you went to do whatever you were supposed to do. That was executive function, self-control. The other thing that the frontal lobes control is judgment. The fact that the frontal lobes aren't developed until age 25 is thought to be the reason that adolescents and young adults tend to do stupid stuff. You probably did stupid stuff. Your kids have probably done stupid stuff. Why is that? They lack the frontal lobes. Marijuana has been shown to interfere with frontal lobe development. Ideally, you wouldn't want anybody under the age of 25 using marijuana. I hope you can see where 25 is. Uh, can, Karen, can you point it out where 25 is? Right above Karen is 25. You can see by far and away the people who use it the most are the very people you don't want to use the stuff. This is from the National Survey on uh, drug use and health. And by the way, those numbers are low. Those numbers are from about four years ago. It's really gone up in the 18 to 25 age group, the use across the United States. This is the Monitoring the Future study. 
This is from University of Michigan, my alma mater in medical school. This is the most respected study for this type of data. They have been interviewing 12th graders for the last 40 years. In about every three years, they put out a new study. This data is from the 2017 version. You can download it on the internet if you want to see it yourself. You can just go to Google, Monitoring the Future. It's 180 pages. It's not all about marijuana. It's about a bunch of different stuff. But they do have a part about marijuana. Look at the blue line. The blue line shows what 12th graders were reporting, self-reporting, as their marijuana use. In about 1978, where there's a peak in the blue line, greater than 10% of 12th graders were reporting daily use. That dropped until about 1992 when less than 2% were reporting daily use. And it's slowly been going up since then. If you look at the orange line, the orange line tells what risk those same 12th graders perceive from smoking marijuana regularly. You could see it was at its low point in about 1979. The risk perception went up to about 1992 and then it's slowly been dropping. The point of this is, is that people in the medical literature believe that marijuana use by 12th graders or by young people is inversely related to their perception of risk. And perception of risk has been dropping over the last few decades. But if there's one slide that concerns me the very most, it's this one. This is the Christchurch study. This is from uh, New Zealand. The best longitudinal studies about marijuana are from New Zealand and Australia right now. There is a huge study going on in the United States, but it won't be out for eight to 10 years that will dwarf these studies. But these are the best studies now. I want you to look at that blue down going line. The first dot all the way to the left on the blue line tells you that if a person has never smoked marijuana between the ages of 14 and 21, their chance of earning a bachelor's degree by the age of 25 is just under 40 percent. It's about 37, 38 percent. If you smoke marijuana 100 to 200 times, your chances drop to about half of that, to about 19 percent. If you smoked it 200 to 400 times, your chances drop to about 10 percent. So they halved again. And if you smoke greater than 400 times between the ages of 14 and 21, your chances drop to near zero of getting a college degree by age 25. Now, the reference is on there. It's from a, a journal called Addiction. The authors thought that this probably was causal, that marijuana probably caused this. It wasn't just an association, it was causal. What's the evidence that it's causal. Well, there's three things. One, it's a longitudinal study. If you're trying to prove causality in humans on this sort of thing, a longitudinal study is what you have to do. That means you follow a group of people from being kids to being adults all the way. So it's like a 20-year, 30-year study. That's the only way to prove causality. And, and, and this, along with two others, are the best studies we have right now. Secondly, it showed dose effect. The more marijuana you used, the worse the effect got. Third, the study was well controlled. They looked at kids where they were smoking, drinking, using other illicit drugs. Was there child abuse, sexual abuse? What was the educational level of the parents? Was there a broken home? What was the uh, uh, wealth of the parents? And they had about 20 things that they controlled for. And so those three things all tend to say that this is causal. Now, this study and two others from Australia and New Zealand were looked at in Lancet Psychiatry in 2014. So they reviewed all three studies together and looked at them. And their conclusion was all three studies showed the same thing. This is failure to launch. By the way, there are other studies that show this for college students. You know, this is 14 to 21. There's, a, there's similar studies that show it for college students. Studies aren't quite so robust but it just doesn't look good. Marijuana appears to cause failure to launch for young people. Young people who use it just don't appear to hit their potential. And to me, that is the most disturbing thing about marijuana. And we don't, you know, ideally, you don't want anybody under 25 using the stuff. But again, by far and away, 
that she uses it the most. Oh, you'll love this one. Okay, this is U.S. smoking rate. Over the last 50 years, it's dropped from 42%. In 1965, 42% of us adults in this room would have smoked. The current most recent number from CDC in 2018, just released a couple months ago, is 14%. And notice it's been almost linear going down. You know, it hasn't gone up and down, it's almost gone straight down. What happened? Well, we required a health warning in 1965. That was just after the Surgeon General's report. I remember all this, by the way. I'm old enough to remember this, and several of you, I think, are too, although some of you are not. TV and radio ads were made illegal in about 1970. How'd they do that? They had a federal statute that made them illegal. We've never done that with alcohol. By rights, we should do that with alcohol, in my opinion. I'm not, I, I drink. I'm not a prohibitionist. But should we be allowing anybody to advertise the stuff, to push it? Smoking was banned on domestic flights in about 1988. California banned smoking in restaurants, and a lot of places were banning smoking. My hospital in Peoria, St. Francis, banned in about 1992. So it was becoming banned in public. Now the last two things I put on, th these last two things I put on there, the FDA banned flavored cigarettes. They banned them in 2009. Why did they ban them? Because of what's called initiation. Flavored cigarettes, they didn't ban menthol, by the way, but the FDA had just announced a couple weeks ago, some of you may be aware of this, that they're after menthol now. Thank goodness, they should be. They banned flavored cigarettes because they were used for initiation. Marty and I are 14 right now. We're in our second childhood, and I say, Marty, try this cigarette. Marty says, no, I'm not going to do that. I say, Marty, it's cherry flavored. And that was shown to be an effective way to initiate kids. So the FDA banned flavored cigarettes. Now, look what Illinois did in 2012. In 2012, Illinois banned flavored cigarette papers and flavored blunt papers. And if you look at the Chicago Tribune, I have a copy of it in my, uh, on my computer if you want to see it. If you look at the article, the supporters of the bill said it was because these type of papers were used with marijuana and crack cocaine. There was only one legislator, it was a senator, only one, leg so it couldn't have been Marty, but there was only one legislator who voted against the bill. All others voted for the bill, including the current sponsors of the marijuana bill. They all voted for the bill. They thought it was a good idea to outlaw flavored blunt papers, but now they want to allow this. You know, what the hay? What the hay? This is flavored cigarettes on steroids. Flavored blunt papers on steroids. So what are they thinking? One last thing I'm going to show you is a little bit of Illinois economics. Uh, if, if, oh, sorry. You know, marijuana, if it's legalized, clearly will bring in a lot of tax money. Okay. And some people, everybody knows Illinois has a lot of debt. You know, that's a lot of money. Which one's bigger? They're both a lot of money. Well, you can look at the projected income from uh, marijuana, and this is what the sponsors say. So this is the sponsors number. They see 350 million to 700 million a year, which is 29 million to 58 million a month. Okay? If you amortize Illinois debt, Illinois debt present value is 130 billion. If you take a 4.25% interest rate, because that's what Illinois has to pay to borrow money now. That's what Illinois pays, because they have a poor rating. And you amortize it for 50 years, because you want to make the payment as low as possible. You have to pay $523 million a month. $58 million, the high number, doesn't come close. It, marijuana cannot amortize the debt. Is it a lot of money? Yeah, it's a lot of money. Th that's a lot of money too, and it just turns out that the debt is way up there. So I could say more. I have a lot more I'd like to tell you, but it's probably time to let Aaron speak. Thank you. <laughs>